Uh, we would like to know uh, about the Skinner. We, love, uh, we would like to know more about um, these psychologists because he's one of the most important of the history and you have been with him. So if you can tell us about, about the Skinner. Well, um, actually, I, I, I had limited interaction with Skinner as a student. As I mentioned earlier, when, when, uh, when I was a graduate student, yes, the lab was there. He had created all of those things. We read his works. Uh, he wasn't around a lot. Uh, you would occasionally see him. He didn't even teach many courses formally. Um, there was some, but uh, uh, so he was more of a model. Um, he was also uh, um, uh, um, uh, well, maybe the best thing to do is to tell a couple of stories. Okay, mm -hmm. okay go ahead. Um, one, uh, I did as a as a as a postdoc. Once I became a postdoc, I had the responsibility of helping out. Skinner taught a course to undergraduates. Uh, it was it was. Uh, Natural Sciences, one, NetSci 114, we called it, Natural Sciences 114. And it was taken by Harvard undergraduates. And Skinner had written a book for that course specifically. You may know of it. It's called Science and Human Behavior. Uh, he had changed from, from writing things that were very much data-based and, and very formal to a much more informal style in Science and Human Behavior. But one of the things he did in that course was to have some demonstrations, and it was my job to prepare uh, uh, some of these demonstrations in one particular year. Um, now, all of those of us who were graduate students at around that time um, recognized the importance of uh, Skinner's work and what he was doing. Um, uh, but we also had a sort of informal competition. We wanted to prove to ourselves uh, that he was human, um, fallible, and every so often somebody would, would pick out something that Skinner had written somewhere and, uh, uh, and then would try to do some research to show that Skinner had been wrong about something. Mm -hmm. For example, at the end of the book, Verbal Behavior, is uh, uh, is a, are some added pieces, and one of them was a piece on animal cries. And Skinner there had said that animal cries are essentially um, analogous to well, not so much Pavlovian uh, kinds of behavior, but they were they were species specific, and they were not very um, uh, sensitive to reinforcing consequences. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, well, it turns out that in some ways Skinner was correct about that, but in not, not in every way, because, uh, one colleague of mine, a graduate student, uh, well, I guess by that, yeah, a graduate student named Harlan Lane, um, started working with chicks and started working with schedules reinforcement for those who are not too familiar with schedules. A response can produce a consequence, but not every response does so. And you can arrange it so the response produces its consequence uh, after a certain number of instances, in which case we call it a ratio schedule. And that tends to produce high rates or the response at certain times will then produce a consequence. We call that an interval schedule. It tends to generate low rates. And Harlan Lane started arranging reinforcers for the chirping of chicks. These are relatively young birds, recently, mm -hmm. aged, and they would chirp away. And he could show that with schedules of reinforcement, he could get uh, high rates with ratios and lower rates with intervals. He could get um, he could differentially reinforce higher and lower rates of, of chirping. And therefore, he concluded that, in fact, these chirps were um, susceptible to reinforcing consequences. And therefore, Skinner was not quite right in that section he had written about animal cries. So that was one case. And, and, and a couple of other people did various uh, other sorts of things. Oh, but Skinner was still correct in the sense that you could change the rate and the patterning and time of these chirps, but you could not change the topographies of the chirps themselves. They were 
fairly fixed. Um, just as uh, Skinner had talked about the um, the pecking of the pigeon, the pigeon pecks on the key. Mm -hmm. And uh, even very early on, Skinner said, well, that peck is a response with a certain genetic unity. It, mm -hmm. it to occur, and when it occurs, it has a certain characteristic uh, has certain characteristics that are uh, are constant, but but you can also there manipulate when it occurs and how often it occurs and whether it occurs more or less often. Well, here I was in the position of setting up these demonstrations for Skinner, and he left the he left his teaching assistants. Uh, people like me who were doing these things with a fair amount of leeway. He did want to demonstrate a little bit of schedules. He did usually want to demonstrate what then he called superstition, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he And he also wanted to demonstrate stimulus control, that the they could get a different performance in the presence of one stimulus on the key than in another stimulus on the key, or what we call discrimination. Um, so I was able to set all of those things up. I had one bird uh, where the main preparation for the demonstration was that this bird was well, it was feeder trained. And if we put it in the chamber in front of the class and operated the feeder, the bird would come right away to eat. We didn't wait for it to teach it that in the, in the classroom. Well, if you operate the feeder at a regular, not too long intervals, like every 20 seconds, Mm -hmm. Then the first time the feeder comes up, the bird is doing something. The feeder comes up, it goes and eats. The feeder drops down. It's likely to repeat what it happened to be doing. And so again, the feeder comes up while the bird is doing the same thing. Now, Skinner saw that as particularly important. And he started talking about the capture of that accidental relationship behavior by the reinforcer as superstition mm -hmm. but every bird would be different um and 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 once they started doing something it would drift over time if you kept on doing this for a long period of time you'd find that gradually that behavior changed to something else well our demonstration was fine because we only went a few minutes and this particular bird happened to be moving its beak toward the ceiling of the chamber and mm -hmm. so turned to the class and said, look, the bird is looking toward the great reinforcer in the sky. <laughs> now, I mentioned superstition in particular, not simply because it was part of this demonstration, but also uh, because it stayed as part of the concern uh, that people had as they did experiments, because if you deliver reinforcers, and even though they're independent of behavior, the idea was that you could create all these problems because you get these accidental correlations building in behavior, and it might not be the behavior you want to see. What Skinner didn't acknowledge back then, and what it took us a very long time to discover, is that uh, um, and, and the very fact that the behavior is highly variable uh, is a clue is that it's not a long-term worry. Animals are very sensitive to whether their behavior is producing consequences. And they will eventually behave differently if their behavior is producing a consequence or if their behavior is accidentally followed by something that happens. Mm -hmm. And the reason that was a problem is that uh, people were afraid of just breaking the relationship between the response and the stimulus. Uh, and they wanted to just take that reinforcer away. So the message became, oh, I've got this child who is engaging in problem behavior. When I want to check out at the supermarket, uh, and we're taking the child past the candy and all the other things at the checkout, and this child starts to cry or something, and, and I could give the child some candy, but then it, it's an accidental relationship. We, we, we have to break this relationship, mm -hmm. um, and therefore we must extinguish that response. We must stop reinforcing it. Well, then you get the child throwing a tantrum, and you're in the supermarket. You have every other customer looking at you. Mm -hmm. 
But this was the message that people who were taking courses in, the, in sort of just the basic courses, especially in psychology, would get. If you don't like this behavior, just stop reinforcing it. Well, I used to uh, lecture that way too. But later on, as I got more involved with the applied work, and I, I worked uh, near here, I, I live not far away from the Kennedy Krieger Institute, which is part of Johns Hopkins University. And there they, uh, they have many children uh, with developmental problems, uh, children on the autism spectrum, some of whom engage in self-injurious behavior. They'll bite themselves. They'll uh, build other things that are, that are problems. In, and uh, and I, I began to be involved with the people there because we were developing a joint program in applied behavior analysis with UMBC and with the Kennedy Krieger Institute at Hopkins. And I began talking to the people who did that. And they said, well, we don't do extinction on the wards. If, those if, if this child's self-injurious behavior is maintained by social reinforcers, if the parent pay more attention to the child when the child is banging his head than when the child is behaving in some less worrisome way, um, then those reinforcers must be important. Why should we just take them away? No, let's use them constructively. So they began to deliver reinforcers independently of behavior. Once you break the correlation, it may take a little longer. The behavior goes away. It will go away just as it goes away when you take the reinforcer away completely in extinction. And that has become the choice in doing, uh, in doing these kinds of applied work. Don't use extinction. It's aversive to everybody involved deliver the reinforcers independently. In order to get to the point where people saw this as a productive way to move from, from problem behavior that's maintained by reinforcers to delivering those reinforcers independently of behavior and then shaping other stuff, had to give up on the worry, the, the old worries about superstition. And that's happened gradually in the field it's taken half a century to get there. Change is slow in science sometimes. Um, but it, it's an important thing to know about. But let's get back to the demonstration because there was another part. Well, yes, it was uh, uh, one of the things was to get a bird who, uh, who, when the key was green, would peck according to a ratio schedule, respond at high rates, and the key turned red and during that time another schedule operated in the pigeon pecked at lower rates but i was preparing also this demonstration and while i was doing it i was getting one animal eating from the food magazine and skinner had often talked about the flapping of the birds if you've got a bird and you take it out of its home cage it flaps wow. vigorously when you take it out and Skinner said, well, that's, that behavior is not, uh, is emotional behavior. It's not reinforceable. And well, there I was um, working on this. And I was also teaching my first course. I was teaching a course in comparative psychology. And one of the things I did in that course was I spent some time on motor systems and locomotion in animals. And then I spent some time on sensory systems and, I, and so on. And when I studied uh, motor systems, I had done some reading to give a couple of lectures on flight in birds. And flight in birds is kind of interesting because the uh, most birds have two modes of flight. They have a very vigorous flight in taking off and the wings actually push down against the air and they get themselves going. But then they get themselves up to airspeed and the wings stay out and it's mainly the wing tips that are flapping and the, and the feathers are moving back and forth and actually the feathers are actually functioning like propellers the feathers give the bird the forward thrust and the airfoil of the wings gives them the lift those two kinds of flight the vigorous takeoff are governed by different muscles as you know mm -hmm. birds have the light meat and the dark meat well the dark meat is typically postural muscle and it has lots of myoglobin in it and those muscles can work for a long period of time. 
Uh, the white meat doesn't have myoglobin in it, and mainly it can keep going depending on the on the blood supply. And those white meat muscles fatigue much more rapidly. Mm -hmm. So the bird can do that vigorous stuff, but very soon it has to stop. If it can't get up to airspeed, it has to come down and land. So I knew about those kinds of things about the bird muscles. And so there I was working with this bird for the demonstration, and it began to flap in front of the feeder. So I did operate the feeder and reinforce that flap, but then I turned the lights off and let the bird rest because I knew that if I wanted to, if I kept the bird flapping for a long time, those muscles would fatigue. Then a little bit, I turned things on. And what I did was I created schedule control of wing flapping. Mm -hmm. And I brought that demonstration into class. Now, that was, uh, I, when I think back on doing it, I, I find it remarkable that I, I did it because I, I was essentially demonstrating in front of this whole class of undergraduates that wing flapping can be reinforced, even though Skinner had said it couldn't. Mm -hmm. And then I went further. I, I demonstrated the pigeon flapping its wings, changing schedules. And then I closed by saying, and now that we've taught this bird to flap, our next step is going to be to shape its flying. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, this is really a, a story that's relevant to Skinner because he didn't get angry. <laughs> well, if, if you showed him data, that was it. He was persuaded by the data. But he turned to me and he said, Charlie, you really should have told me ahead of time that you were going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it was never any I could imagine with some other academics that how could you have done that would have been but no he he was he was very rarely seen angry <laughs> very rarely seen uh critical of of students um he would go with it and if you could show him data that's all that mattered Mm -hmm. And so that was it. Um, he was a very gentle person. Uh, so, uh, as I say, I didn't have a lot of interactions. I did those certain tasks for him. We built some apparatus for particular things. He, by that time, he was he was so involved uh, outside of the university and traveled to give talks and so on that that we didn't see much of him. And he was withdrawing from the active participation in the laboratory. Uh, at the time when I was there. In fact, I would, I later was privileged as um, uh, I became involved in a journal called uh, Behavioral and Brain Sciences. That was a journal that would publish a, an article and then lots of people would write commentaries and then the author would respond. And uh, uh, we got Skinner to uh, then uh, uh, participate in that with some of his classic papers. So we had the, uh, uh, um, and one of them was selection by consequences. Um, so that paper was sent out to a bunch of commentators. Uh, they wrote commentaries and then Skinner responded to all of them. And then the whole thing eventually got published not only in the journal, but later as a book with six different uh, pieces that he worked on. Um, and. And in the course of that, because I was involved in the editorship, I had lots of uh, lots of correspondence with Skinner, phone calls and all. And I think I interacted more with him in that project than I ever had during all the time I was a graduate student. And it was obviously mm -hmm. a, a daunting kind of thing, but a very rewarding thing. And, and <laughs> one amazing part of it was I'd read these papers and then I'd see the commentaries and I'd start thinking about how I would reply and then I saw what Skinner did, and it was something totally different. I had never occurred to me to reply that way. It's a fascinating, <laughs> fascinating uh, project. 